our working group, myself, Jeff Zimmerman, Luke Dufresne, um, John Paul Cano, and uh, this is a work in process. I think uh, one of the things we'd like to lead to, which and I think it's also the case with all the working groups, is to get something that's publishable at some point. But uh, we've got a long ways to go, and so uh, you guys are sharing in the, the research, so to speak. Presentation-wise, I want to start here. Who knows what that is? It's the same thing, all three of these pictures. It's a trout. What kind of trout is it? It's a rainbow, but what kind of rainbow is it? <laughs> Come on, you should know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blue trout. Blue trout are extremely rare. That's one of the challenges with purse testing is we're looking for rare. Okay. At the point that we want to progress towards elimination, through elimination and uh, maintain negative status, whether it's a site or a flow or a system or an area, region, the country, eventually, we got to be able to find those and we got to be able to find the real ones. That's a blue trout. And I actually, believe it or not, I caught one of those last week in uh, Idaho. Okay, and Reed and Phil Hayes and myself went uh, backpacking in the uh, Sawtooth Wilderness area and we were had bushwhacked up to a lake. Those guys were out on a lake with their float tubes uh, catching trout right and left. And I was standing on the shore with my little collapsible Zebco reel. I bummed a little tippet off of them and, and a fly just thrown from the shore and, and snagged one of these little babies. And I thought, I've never seen a fish like that before. Blue, blue rainbow trout, very rare. Okay, so... PERS behavior is what it's all about, understanding PERS behavior and detecting PERS behavior. So the fundamental question for us is what sustainable sampling for PERS look like for area regional control and the context of today is uh, where does oral fluid sampling fit in that uh, context. Okay, so Bob and I were talking one day. Um, who knows which one Bob is and which one's... <laughs> Bob's the smart looking one. <laughs> I need to carry an oil can with me everywhere I go. Okay, so we said, what does it look like? And uh, more of us have also been talking about uh, what does it need to look like sustainable, because sustainable is the key. Okay, but first I'm going to give you guys a little quiz. Who is this man and why do some of us accept his research before most of us. Anybody want to venture a guess? Well, this is a guy named Everett Rogers. Everett Rogers developed something called the diffusion of innovations theory. And so if we go back two slides, why do some of us accept his research before most of us? It fits with Everett Rogers, born in Carroll, Iowa in 31. It fits with Everett Rogers' theory of dif uh, diffusion of innovations. But here's where area regional control fits in that, is we need something that's sustainable, but it has to be widely accepted and utilized. Hey, we're not there yet. We're a long ways from there yet. But we're on our way there. So here's the diffusion of innovations theory. You guys have heard this before. There's innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Okay, I, I think we're back in this area. Okay, diffusion of innovations. But to become widely accepted and utilized, we got a ways to go for early majority, late majority, to adopt something that is driven by this key, sustainable. What's sustainable and what are the characteristics of sustainable? This is taken from a presentation that Jeff and I did uh, last December at the uh, uh, pre ipers session. And when Jeff and I were kind of thinking this through, talking it through, we said, well, what are the keys to sustainable? And we think there's three. It's got, obviously got to be inexpensive to implement. It's got to be simple and easy to do perpetually. Not just once, but perpetually because surveillance, uh, monitoring, those are keys. And it has to deliver ongoing value for participants, obvious. Okay. Three levels of magnitude to what sustainable is. There's the micro, macro, and meta. I'm going to skip the micro. That's like the 
site level type of stuff. Um, but I want to jump to macro, area regional level. Okay, there has to be something that, it, any information you collect, whether it's diagnostics, production data, financial data, whatever it is, it, it has to support better decision making. It's all about decision making. Okay, but in the case, at, at the macro level, uh, area regional control, it's not just decision making at the site or the flow level, it's the decision making at the community, so to speak, level, the neighborhood. And by definition, decision making at a community level needs to be collaborative. Okay, so what's sustainable and what supports community or collaborative decision making? Okay, also a characteristic, there needs to be both some direct value on the animals we're looking at, on the flows we're looking at directly. There also has to be some indirect value. In other words, what risk, or what are the consequences you experience at the site or the flow itself, but then also what risk do you pose to your neighbors? What risk do your neighbors pose to you? Okay, sustainable, but it's all about decision making and value. Okay, so a couple things I just want to touch on briefly. There's a tremendous amount of potential for oral fluids to support sustainable at the macro as well as meta level. We'll look at it a little bit later on as well. And it's also the case, I think, that uh, FTA cards uh, fit that bill as well, support sustainable and decision making. They have some limitations in terms of sensitivity at the sample level. If you're going to collect uh, oral fluid samples versus serum samples from an infected pig, um, there may be some sensitivity uh, implications different than would be the case if you're collecting them from pens and then pigs in pens. Uh, FTA cards, there's things you give up, things you gain, um, so there's trade-offs involved. But the idea is for, for it to be sustainable, it's got to follow a, um, the old Netflix model. It has to be Netflix easy. You say, I want to look at this list of movies. You order them. It shows up in your mailbox. You watch it. You send it back, and you get another one. It has to be that automatic. It needs to be Netflix easy for pigs. You make the schedule. The kits show up. You sample. You send them back. It needs to be automatic. And it needs to be something that, and I think, Jim, you mentioned it, um, DVMs don't need to go out and snare and bleed. It needs to be something that is doable on an ongoing continuous basis by people on the farms. Just uh, a couple of things I want to touch on. Uh, Jeff Zimmerman, John Pritchett uh, did I think a really nice uh, study where they took a barn, 40 pens, 1,000 pigs, um, and then at day zero put one virus challenged pig, in this case I think you guys used vaccine virus, is that right? In each pen and then they hung a rope a day for a week just to see if they could pick up one infected pig in a pen. The net of all of this day zero through day seven was 64 percent. Is that right Jeff? And so the 64 percent that you guys used as kind of your overall number was uh, to compare two if you were going to sample 25 pigs in the barn randomly versus one hang one rope. Using Jeff and John's numbers, we're looking at four different scenarios here, and there's their probability of detection of 64%, uh, and that's bleeding 25 pigs randomly out of a population of 1,000 animals. There's 40 pens. So here we've got serum bleeding, there's 1,000 pigs in all of these scenarios. There's 40 pens in all these scenarios. Here we simulated sampling 25 pigs, no ropes or pens, the probability of detection 64%. Here, this is their one infected pig in every pen, probability of detection 64%. And that's sampling one pen out of 40 pens where there were, was one infected pig in every pen. Okay, that's an important point. Because these next two are saying, well, you may or may not have 
one or more infected pigs in every pen. And so what would it be look like potentially if there were fewer? And just to keep it simple, we said, okay, well, there's still 1,000 pigs, still 40 in, uh, pens. There's still in all the barns 40 infected pigs, but they're not necessarily evenly distributed. In these scenarios, we say, let, let's look at one rope per, in a pen in the barn. Let's look at two ropes, one in each of two different pens, four ropes, one in each of four different pens. And the assumption that I made, which this is a testable hypothesis, but it's, this is an assumption, that if you're going to go from one to two ropes in a barn versus uh, two to four, you're going to have the difference between the 64% and 100. So I said, if you go to two, it kicks up to 82%. If you go to four, it kicks up to 91%. And that's because you still have 40 infected pigs in the barn. It's just that in this scenario, there's 40 pigs in 20 pens, two of 20 pens, and then half the pens, there's no infected pigs. In the last one, there's 40 infected pigs in across 10 pens and none in 30 pens. Four different scenarios. One of the points here was, how can you design a sampling and testing protocol that gives you a comparable detection likelihood for situations where not all the pens contain infected pigs? But in all these cases, the uh, barn prevalence at the animal level is still 4%. Where we had half the pens infected and hung two ropes, it's comparable detection to 25 pigs and one rope where all the pens contain an infected pig, where there were only 10 infected pens, but each pen had four infected pigs, 30 contained no infected pigs, it's comparable as well. This is the approach that we intend to use to help develop tables that help us make decisions on sampling and testing protocols along the lines of what Cannon and Rowe did for individual animal sampling and testing. Okay, that's the idea here is, now, confirmation of these observations, theory, if you will, would be doing what Jeff and John did, but for different uh, scenarios, um, looking at two infected in half the pens or four infected in a fourth of the pens, those types of things, to see if theory reconciles with observation of uh, real-life scenarios. Um, there's trade-offs with pooling, whether it's serum, oral fluids, and the trade-offs are magnified with oral fluids because you have a different starting point. Okay. There may be rational and potentially reasonable justifications for even pooling oral fluid samples. However, one of the things that we clearly need to understand is what we give up to do it, and if the net net um, makes us worse off, or as good off, or better off. I, I think one of the takeaways here is, uh, and this, there, I have a lot of favorite quotes, but this is one of them: is uh, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. Okay, meaning that we can oversimplify, and that's I believe an Einstein quote. Okay, we can oversimplify. Okay, so we we don't want to go so simple that we become primitive, so to speak, but we do want to figure out what is simple and simple enough without uh, kind of falling off the edge. Okay, another thing, and, and uh, uh, Monse uh, at U of M and uh, Albert, you guys have done a lot of work with uh, FTA cards. I think, Jeff, you guys are uh, working with FTA cards as well. Um, in terms of sustainable I think FTA cards hold a lot of promise. Again, we know, just based on some stuff that uh, we've done working with uh, Monse and Albert, that you do sacrifice sensitivity. But one of the nice things about uh, sensitivity is you can make up for uh, reductions in sample level sensitivity or pool sensitivity by taking more samples. It is possible to compensate uh, to an extent for that. But there's a lot of favorable characteristics uh, with FTA cards and samples on FTA cards 
that uh, I think support sustainable Netflix easy uh, approaches. Okay, another thing that I think supports the approach is how do we manage this data? And I use uh, Global Vet Lake as, as an example is the easier we can make movement of data, um, the better off we're going to be, the more sustainable it's going to be. Okay, and then also to that point, when we talk about meta now, multi-regional and networked regions for surveillance and assessing global indirect value and local direct value. Indirect value would be reducing risk within and between areas. Local direct value is picks perform better. And then also an entire industry value. Uh, there's a meta perspective to that. And one of the things that I think supports a uh, meta value would be uh, databases like the uh, disease bioportal at University of California Davis um, was developed for uh, foot and mouth disease, swine vesicular disease, and uh, Newcastle's, I believe, are the three that it was developed on the, the uh, back of. Okay, but overviews are fine, easy to deliver, but the devil's in the details, and so there's a lot of work. But I think the format that uh, Bob and Cap are taking here with uh, having working groups and then soliciting uh, input and uh, feedback and interaction across the industry is the right way to go.